All right. Ready to go? Cool. All right. Thank you to B-Sides, and thank you for coming to, uh, to see my talk. My name's Adam Hogan. Uh, I'm a security engineer for, uh, for CrowdStrike, uh, though I'm not talking about that today. Um, what I'm actually talking about is pirates and a proposal to legalize hacking back. Uh, a bit of a controversial topic to be sure, but um, what I want to talk about is, uh, well, first of all, pirates, because that's what led me here. Um, I don't know if anyone saw my talk a year ago, but I was actually talking about how I started learning about pirates as a way to learn about uh, criminal organizations. I had started doing some research on um, the economics of uh, exploit kits in some, some black markets, uh, and ultimately hit a lot of dead ends, because it's pretty hard to learn about black markets. Uh, and what I ended up doing was starting to learn instead about some um, some more histori historical criminal organizations, uh, which led me to pirates. And uh, what I started looking at was that they had a lot of the similar challenges. Uh, when, when pirates first became a problem, uh, it was because there was the, the international waters were beyond national uh, law. There was this whole new medium in which people were operating that went, went beyond normal definitions of crime. Uh, and they had to find out new ways to legislate it, new ways to go and catch them, new ways to uh, stop these bad guys. Uh, and I thought that sounded awfully familiar. Uh, so I was really looking at pirates. Um, and actually, if you uh, did a talk about that uh, last year here, we sort of turned around from there. Instead of just learning about the bad guys themselves, look at, OK, well, how did we stop pirates? Right? If they are so similar, what did we learn about what actually was, were successful in uh, catching pirates and stopping them uh, and bringing this criminal organization to, to heel? Uh, and what I actually found out was one of the most successful ways uh, was called privateering, which actually allowed people to go after the pirates themselves, which leads me to the hacking back debate. So I want to go through that. I want to go through the controversy because it's uh, considerable and for very good reasons. Uh, and then actually go out that this could actually suggest a regulatory framework of which we could sort of solve a lot of the problems that we see around the hacking back debate. My goal here is not to convince you hacking back is, is this wonderful thing, we should all be doing it or anything like that. It's not. In fact, the most frustrating part of this debate is everyone seems to be talking about whether everyone should be hacking back or no one should be hacking back, and it's obvious that those two polls are, are, are both incorrect. Uh, but we seem to have stopped in, in the debate, right? Uh, regardless of, of addressing, like, yeah, there are really significant concerns with hacking back. Okay, why aren't we working on addressing them directly? And that's ultimately what I want to do today, is convince you that there's a way to move forward and, and address those concerns directly. Also, I want to suggest that we should be doing that uh, ourselves. Uh, I think we should be regulating ourselves uh, instead of waiting for legislators to do it for us. And it's actually something we're starting to see, is the new laws coming out to talk about legalizing hacking back. Uh, and again, uh, what we're looking to do as professionals is what reduce time to the detection, increased time to recovery, and um, the bad guys can reinvent themselves and all their attacks in the time it takes a legislature to pick out the calligraphy for the invitation to the dinner where you'll talk about proposals to the law that you'd like to change, right? Uh, we can't wait for that. So again, I also want to talk about laying out a framework we might be able to agree on in the hopes that we can regulate ourselves as a community instead of waiting for someone else to try and do it. So ultimately, I came the pirates, and again, I sort of talked about uh, why I saw that. We actually learned a lot about the adversaries. I learned an awful lot of respect for them. Uh, uh, ultimately, the pirates were so successful because they could adapt and change so much quicker than the Navy could, than, the, than merchants could. Uh, and why were they so successful? But while, um, and which is really pretty interesting. Uh, also, you can go, the farther back in time you go, you realize how romanticized pirates are. Um, it's, it's, it's honestly, they were, Criminals against humanity at the time. They redefined it. These weren't just like thieves at sea. They were, these were like tried to, to recategorize these crimes against humanity. It is, it is literally like thinking into the future and thinking that Disney might do a kid's movie about terrorists 300 years from now. That's about where we are with pirate movies. All right? So these are horrible, horrible people. Uh, but we still go back and romanticize uh, uh, like I these dashing rogues at sea and, and, and all these kind of things. Right? But, one of the more compelling ways we actually found to stop pirates was by uh, commissioning privateers, which was if you were a merchant or you wanted to go into the pirate hunting business, you could actually get a what was called a letter of mark and reprisal that actually gave you a license to go out and hunt pirates. It means, okay, we're going to specify these pirates or, I don't know, criminals in this area, or maybe if we're at war, we'll just say, hey, anybody from this country, right? And uh, so you've got this commission, the specific sexual license to go after these types of, of pirates. This was successful hunting pirates, and by the way, it was also 
instrumental in America continuing to be a country. Um, it, numerous historians have pointed out that without uh, privateering, uh, America probably would not ha have um, won the um, Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, uh, and certainly uh, the first war uh, with terrorists, uh, the uh, Barbary pirates who were harassing uh, American trade uh, on, the, on the other side of the ocean. And that kind of leads me back in the hacking back. If we want to emulate this way that was successful in stopping pirates, we're talking about going uh, a bit actively pursuing our attackers, which leads us in that hacking back controversy. And we also want to try and draw the line here because far too often we lump in cyber self-defense with retribution. And we need to draw that line. There is a huge difference between somebody broke in my house and I shot them, and somebody broke into my house, so I chased them down the street and then shot them, right? Totally different things, but we want to be able to make those distinctions. We want to be able to make the distinction of <clears throat> where we have a right to go after an attacker, because today, that is all very, very murky from a legal framework. Why we want to do this is, well, ultimately, traditional law enforcement models just aren't going to scale for the internet. That's all clear, right? Because we're all here um, doing this job. Right, the reason these kind of jobs invented is because there was this whole new class of crime that was invented and uh, now it's kind of up to us because that traditional model isn't scaling. Right, that's just fact. But, but also we want to make it difficult to be a criminal. Right, we want to make it more costly to be a criminal. We don't want to say, well, it should have had a better firewall. Uh, no, we want to be able to you know, go after him if we can, if it's possible. We want to make sure that we're doing it in a way we can uh, agree that's going to be safe and effective. Because there are considerable hack, uh, objections to being allowed to, to hack back. Uh, and I actually want to go through them because they're, um, some of them are really good uh, and, and actually deserve uh, some attention. The one that's most often talked about is whether or not it's actually legal to hack back. I want to kind of skip over that. If that's interesting to you, um, uh, maybe we can come back to it at the end if you have questions about it. Um, but ultimately what I'm proposing is that we sort of work on ways to make it legal, that we need a better framework because Regardless, uh, the laws are a gray area. It's this huge gray area, and that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. If you ask the federal government, is hacking back illegal? They say, probably. Uh, and, and beyond that, um, someone has to decide to prosecute you. And if you're literally going after bad guys, I don't think that's going to happen. If it did, there are many different ways you could appeal. Uh, but again, I want to skip over that because ultimately what I'm proposing is, like, let's look at a framework to make this, this legal and, and more acceptable uh, on a societal level. To which I think the failings of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act address this, because it is so nebulous, because it is so um, uh, uh, gray, uh, international law may actually play a part, because, say, um, under Article 22 of the United Nations Responsibility of States for International Wrongful Acts, the wrongfulness of an act is precluded if and to the extent that, that act constitutes a countermeasure. So beyond, Amer uh, beyond U.S. law, there is also recognition that, okay, if someone's harmed you, there is a different set of circumstances and areas for that. But also, we may have a duty to clarify this gray area because of standards in international law that actually say states have an obligation to do due diligence to prevent significant transboundary harm to another state's property. So if we are actually being attacked from some other, in another country and our laws do not address how to respond to that, uh, we could actually have a situation where the government is sort of negligent in their duties to address that, uh, where it could actually be incumbent on us as citizens in order to fill that gap and, um, uh, and go after the bad guy. That actually comes from a precedent set in uh, 1941 uh, from a case that was called the Trail Smelter. Uh, there is a smelter in Trail, British Columbia, uh, that was putting out all kinds of smoke that was actually da uh, damaging uh, forest and farms uh, in, uh, well, Canada and the U.S. Uh, so people in Washington actually sued because it was across national boundaries. It couldn't go to either one of their national courts, right? So it goes to international tribunal um, uh, for arbitration. And what they found and what was set as, uh, as precedent in international law is that a state may not use or allow its national to use its own territory in such a manner to cause injury to a neighboring country. So if a country actually knows that some of this hacking is going on, they're not doing anything about it, they're actually negligent. If they know that that's going on, then we actually have a situation where the citizens may be incumbent on them uh, to respond. So we have a very, very gray area here where we should be working to clear that up, right? 
Another objection uh, to hacking back is the idea of escalation. Uh, and this comes in a few different flavors. Uh, could hacking back create an international incident? Uh, one is, well, there's people always beating the drums and talking about cyber war, which I, I, I don't know. If someone's talking about cyber war, they're probably trying to sell you something or get your vote. I really don't know how, how likely that is. War has a very clear definition, and if no one's being physically harmed, I really don't think we're, we're talking about that scenario. Um, and in fact, there's a great book by Thomas Ridd called uh, The Cyber War Will Not Take Place, something along those lines. Very well thought out, very well written book to really describe that, yeah, this is a whole other world, and frankly, all the incentives are all there to not uh, escalate this into some kind of you know, actual like, physical or kinetic war. But also, there's international precedent to say, like, we don't have to ratchet up uh, into an escalation for these kind of situations. The International Court of Justice actually had a case of Nicaragua versus the United States in 1984, where they actually had um, two uh, people from two different countries were butting heads uh, and actually found that, look, they were in the middle of the frontier. They were out in the wilderness where there wasn't a whole lot of law and order, and we're calling that a frontier incident. We don't have to escalate. It was not an act of war because it was on a frontier, because the law and order of the situation are so poorly defined, and I don't see any reason that couldn't obviously be applied to, uh, to cyberspace. So we don't, I, I think, have to worry about any potential uh, problem going right to war, right? I, there are any number of reasons to believe that's, that, that's uh, um, not likely, and, and international law itself is really set up to give everyone many opportunities to back down from war. If that's not what you want, there are plenty of loopholes to, to, to step out of that. There's also some risk that comes with hacking back. Uh, if you go and attack the hacker, maybe you become a bigger target yourself. Maybe you're actually going to bring some heat on yourself, and that is a legitimate concern. What I don't think it's a legitimate concern is whether or not hacking back should be legal. And I think we are, because we're sort of lumping these things together, uh, we're confusing what should be two separate debates. One, should hacking back be legal? And and under what under what, what circumstances, and two, should you be hacking back? Two wildly different debates, and they are being lumped together, and I think that's where a lot of the confusion uh, in this debate has actually come from. Uh, it's also argued that we shouldn't be hacking back because it could destroy evidence the prosecution would need later to prosecute this crime, which I, I, I find absurd. Um, I don't know how much of a risk that is. I think if prosecutors were prosecuting these people, uh, that we wouldn't be having this discussion. Um, uh, so I don't know how much this is an actual uh, uh, serious uh, objection. It has one I, I've read numerous times, though. Also, the objection that's not uh, effective to the means of that it's not a good idea for, uh, for uh, your return on investment, that the average company shouldn't be hacking back, that uh, it's not going to be wor worth the risk. Um, the reward is really going to be pretty small, and again, I, I agree with that. But again, that's a different, that's that other discussion. It's not whether or not this should be legal, whether it should be possible, it's whether you should be doing it, or you should be doing it, you should be doing it, and uh, frankly, uh, I, I find the idea that everyone should be hacking back, we'll just set up our firewalls to, to hack back, that is absurd. It, it is ridiculous. But that's a character to which I, I don't know why everyone is, is still arguing with, right? Well, and of course, uh, the big one uh, is, is attribution. Uh, attribution is incredibly difficult. How do we know who we're responding to and who we're, we're attacking? Uh, and I really thought I was going to have to double down here and, and talk about how uh, attribution is hard and when it's not. And uh, in the mid-afternoon keynote, John got up here and ran a live demo that showed attribution. Wonderful. What a, a, a weight off my shoulders. Uh, that was fantastic, right? There are very clear situations where we can do we can do attribution, uh, and he, he showed a great example where obviously I don't see where anyone could have an, a legal objection. Uh, I didn't hack into your network. You hacked into mine, and then you took software of mine, and that's allowing me to catch you. That's what we observed earlier in that demo, and uh, that's uh, um, you know the, a considerable legal difference. So. Attribution, yes, it is uh, difficult in some situations, but not in others, frankly. Um, and even uh, when we look at comparing to, say, traditional law, well, even if a conflict rises to the level of war, attribution does not seem to be a firm requirement, at least for an individual soldier in times of imminent danger. It is enough to know that a sniper is shooting you from a certain position without first identifying who the sniper is and what side he is on, his intentions, or anything else. So there are situations where we can say, yeah, yeah, there's risk, but this situation warrants that risk. And that's the discussion we're not having 
because we're so hung up on the possibility of, it, of, of that risk uh, being a situation. And of course, the, the biggest objection, I think, being the idea that there could be a, a decoy or a false flag. Um, does everyone know where the term false flag comes from? It, it comes from, from the era of pirates. Uh, it was totally legal to fly a false flag. Uh, and in fact, it was normal. If you wanted to pretend to be from a southern, another country, you could do that. You put up a false flag. Uh, it was legal to have a false flag unless you were in combat. If you opened fire on someone, you had to have the legitimate flag going. Otherwise, it was totally legal to have a false flag up uh, and, uh, frankly, pretty normal for ships to, to have multiple sets of documentation, which actually we're going to come back to. So, the preeminent example, why is hacking back dangerous? Well, the bad guys could route their attack through a hospital, and that is a, a, a supreme concern. But it also ex raises the example of, well, okay, well, what if I'm running that hospital and I'm under attack? Right? So again, I think we're going to agree there are situations where it warrants attacking back, but we have to address them, recognize those different levels of risk, and say, well, if we are going to put people at risk, if we are going to be shutting down these systems that might be in a hospital, who's going to be responsible for that? That's the problem we're really running into. Um, and then the, another ex example of why hacking back is a problem I've seen come up so often is that if we do that, uh, the internet will be the wild, wild west. Um, and I hope so. Uh, <laughs> uh, to be honest, I, first of all, uh, whoever's making this claim is doing it from a, a place of, of all, all they know about the Wild West is what they learned in movies. Cleveland wishes they had the Wild West uh, crime rate, okay? It was really a pretty safe place to be. Uh, the idea that it wasn't is, is entirely uh, uh, cooked up in myth, right? But again, the, I don't think anybody's arguing for the situation where everybody should have their firewall set to, to hack back, right? That is a character in a straw man that we have to get past in order to identify when the risk is going to be acceptable uh, and the cases where the risk isn't really that significant. Like the, the beaconing back example we saw um, in, in the, the, the keynote John ran. Uh, uh, again, John, he had to run. Uh, but thank you for teeing that up for me. Totally owe you a beer at, uh, at DerbyCon, right? Um, but if I can summarize the objections, what it really comes down to is you're saying, well, not everybody should be hacking back. But I agree with that. I, I think everyone would. And we're also saying that there are problems that could come with hacking back, but the real problem with that is if they're happening quietly, if they're happening silently, if they're happening in a way where no one could be held responsible for them. So what if we can change that? What if we can make... Uh, uh, if we can have a situation where we can actually incentivize people to take some responsibility for their actions. And, and that's where my head automatically goes, but then I, my, my um, graduate study was, was in economics, uh, which is all about trying to lay a, a framework uh, for having the right incentives to get the outcome we want, right? And that's why uh, there's a picture of, of Adam Smith here. So can we add transparency and responsibility to the process? Well. If we look at a privateering model, I am absolutely not the first to suggest that having privateers in the internet is, is, is a way we could go. It has been suggested many times before, but I don't think anyone's actually looked at the legal framework that went around it. Because if we go deeper into the process, there is an entire legal framework to address the, and, and make those people take responsibility for their actions as privateers. We had a prize court. The prize court is actually set up outside of national court. It was a part of the an admiralty court. So it actually exists as a part of maritime law and not national U.S. law or common law. So the prize court was actually set up as a regulatory framework to oversee these privateers. So if you wanted to be a pirate hunter, what you did is you had, one, you had to have that letter of mark and reprisal. So you had to have that, um, so you had to have essentially that license, uh, which wasn't handed out to just anybody. It can be handed out to responsible people, and is in that letter of mark, it could actually specify the target. So it's not a license to go after anybody and everybody, but uh, these particular pirates, or the people that are attacking you, or whoever it is, right? They also had to post a bond. You had to put money up front to get that letter of mark and reprisal, to get that license to go after pirates, because, again, if you were wrong, if you made mistakes, well, you're not getting that back, right? Um, and then the uh, prize transfer, right, getting to keep that pirate ship and any of the uh, booty on board, well, that was only 100% legal once it was awarded by the prize court. The prize court had to sign off on that. So, uh, and that adjudication required public record uh, so that they could review the evidence and the prize court had to sign off on it. So the way that happened 
was actually said that um, a, a decree or sentence of condemnation by a prize court of competent jurisdiction is now universally held to be requisite uh, effect to complete a transfer of maritime prizes from the original owner to the captor. It not being thought fit to use the words of Lord Stowell, uh, who is the judge who really laid the frown, uh, foundation for all of the legal cases and precedent that, that came for uh, these prize courts, uh, to say that uh, the property of the nature should not be converted without the sentence of a competent court. So you had to bring it to the regulatory body. You had to bring it to the prize court for everything to be official. Once you did that, they put out a petition saying, hey, uh, if this is your ship, if you were captured, if you know the owners or whatever, let them know, we're going to have a court case. And if you want to make the case that you weren't a pirate or that you were allowed to be there or that this was taken wrongly, you can show up and defend yourself. The court then undertook questions for one or more representatives um, from the captured crew. So they actually interviewed them. Who are you? Are you a pirate? Are you sure you're not a pirate? And they go through all these questions really see like, okay, what were you doing? Uh, and then, of course, see if their uh, answers matched up with their colleagues and try and figure out, okay, what were you doing? Where were you going? What, you know, why were you guys out there um, uh, to make sure it matched up with the, it being a legitimate capture? And they had to take responsibility for that. After a maritime capture is complete, the possession of the captors is in law regarded as bona fide possession, and they are not responsible for any loss or injuries resulting from mere accident or casualty, but are bound for fair and safe custody uh, and are liable for any loss occasioned by their neglect or want of proper care. This responsibility attaches to loss resulting from misconduct of any of the agents employed in the captors, uh, as of the prize crew uh, and prize master, neglect is not employing a, a pilot uh, or re uh, responsibility. Uh, in cases of gross misconduct on the part of the private captors, the court will decree a revocation of their commission. And I'm going to come back to an example of that, which says, look, if you're going to take a capture someone, you are now responsible for it because it's not really yours yet. It exists in this quasi state where it's kind of yours, but it's not 100% yours till the court signs off. Um, under particular circumstances, uh, and in cases of overruling necessity, captors may, without their being deprived of the effects of lawful possession, land or even sell the prize goods. But in all cases, the burden is upon them to satisfy the court of their perfect good faith and circumstances giving rise to necessity. Which is to say, like, if you take a ship, you can't go route, uh, through their possessions, you can't eat their food, you can't take all that stuff, because it doesn't 100% belong to you yet. Um, except in case of extraordinary circumstances, which is fairly normal when you're at sea. If you're out of food, someone has food, uh, you can kind of take their food and it's this legal gray area, you, you probably have to pay them back later. But this, the difficulty of surviving at sea had some, some different rules. But you were responsibility for, you were responsible to take care of their possessions until it was 100% yours after. And that was again another precedent set by, by Lord Stowell, uh, of the Admiralty Courts of, uh, of London. Now, if you want to get all the uh, spirit of 1776 and you don't care what some snooty British lord had to say about all this, well, here are the exact same sentiments uh, quoted from, from Benjamin Franklin, uh, so you can take a look at those as well. Uh, it was really a matter of common law at that point. It was adapted by the U.S. as, as, as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through them, but it's essentially the same things. But let's take a look at some of the cases because we can actually see this ha uh, working um, in action. So, a case of breaking bulk, which means that you went in, uh, you took a prize, and then you actually went through their stuff and you went through their cargo. There was a, a Swedish vessel called the uh, Falun, Falun, something like that. I, it's a Swedish word. I don't. It probably means bookcase now, but I, whatever it was, um, I don't know a lot of Swedish. Uh, it was captured by the Liverpool packet and the Retaliation, uh, which were English vessels, and they accused uh, the Retaliation's prize master. Uh, Henry Fader, of allowing his crew to break into the cargo of dry goods and fill their jackets so full, quote, that they appeared almost as big as a hog's head with their coats buttoned around them. So they took this ship hostage. They're like, I'm going to go below deck for a while. They come back out. Everybody's all fattened up with all of their, uh, with their goods, with the crew's personal effects and all this. Like, well, we just captured this, these guys. It's ours, right? No, not 100%. You've got to take it to the prize court. And then, and only then, is it 100% yours. So when they brought it to the prize court, they protested. Uh, well, actually, before that, he protested and, 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 uh, and said, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, and the mate uh, was told that if he did not hold his tongue, he would uh, put him in irons 
calling him a damn rascal and many other opprobrious terms, which is how they actually wrote this down. And this is all public record. You can actually go through this. Uh, this is all written down. You can go through these cases and actually see how these, these transpired. But when they brought it to the court and said, okay, we took these, they said, okay, that ship you captured, legitimate pirate. That you went and captured it, totally legitimate. But you can't go into their stuff and take their stuff until the prize court rules. They gave the entire ship back. The captors had to turn everything over and pay an additional 2,000 pounds on top of that because they broke the rules, because they did not yield to the supremacy of the prize court to say, we sign off on when this is legal, not you, and you went in before that, so you're responsible. So they got to keep their ship, even though it would have been a legitimate uh, um, take, and they had to pay another 2,000 pounds. We're talking about integrity, where again, you are responsible for that ship and everything on it. So take the case of the Scottish whaler, the Wraith. It was captured by a French privateer. They removed all the crew except the captain and the first mate. They put a prize crew of 16 Frenchmen uh, in, in, in charge. So at night, nine men forming the watch on deck found the, Scot uh, the Scottish people's whiskey and really got into it. They got incredibly drunk and tumbled into a whaling boat hanging over the side to sleep it off, right? So the two guys whose ship originally this was are standing there like, okay, so the guards all passed out because they can't hold their ruse. The other people that uh, took us hostage are now below deck. So they nailed that door shut, they dropped the whaling boat into the water and took off. They brought it to their prize court uh, not the French prize court, but a Scottish one said, hey, uh, these dicks captured us, uh, and they uh, unnailed them, took all those guys, booted them out, and said, okay, this would have been a legitimate capture, but you screwed up. You were responsible for taking this in safely, and you didn't. You get nothing, right? Um, and kind of badass for two guys to sail a whole ship uh, under, cat, like, you know, taking these guys prisoner and sail the entire ship back by themselves, right? And also, again, one of the biggest problems we have, again, with the hacking back debate is, okay, well, attribution is hard. What if you're wrong about who you're attacking? That problem came up along with privateering. So a case where we had misattribution, the USS Constitution, so an, English, or an American ship now, on her maiden voyage, no less, goes out and uh, is going to cruise uh, French shipping. So this is during the quasi-war with, with uh, France, so any French ship is essentially up for grabs. First capture was a privateer. The ship was called... Uh, the Niger, step into that carefully, um, uh, their documents all indicated that it was a, uh, a British ship. So British um, uh, passport, British registration, the logs, all British. But the captain of the ship was one Georges Dupetit Thussard, who was a French aristocrat who had actually been displaced by the revolution. So the Americans take this ship, they're looking at the documentation, they talk to this French captain, they're like, it's a French ship. So they take it, they take it uh, back to the prize court, and the prize court has to go then through all the evidence. And they're looking at it, and they're like, all, all this documentation says it's British. And I'm like, did you talk to this frog? That guy's French. He's like, yeah, that doesn't matter. That's just the captain. It is a British ship. It is owned by British people, right? It's out of a British port. Uh, you did not have the right to take that. They had to return the ship to its own owners and pay $11,000 in damages. Right? So they were held responsible for making that misattribution and doing the attack based on what was fundamentally faulty intelligence. So they were held to task by the court. Because they were required to uh, engage in this act of transparency, they were able to hold them accountable. Okay? One of the more interesting things I think about it is because, again, what we want to look for in any kind of situation where we're going to be regulating cybersecurity is that it has to be fast, it has to be efficient. Because we can't rely on traditional legislation to do it. This industry changes far too quickly to rely on that. It is remarkable how much people in the prize court valued efficiency. Um, they said that uh, uh, was it? Uh, customer reports tended to limit deliberations uh, to one or two tides. Uh, and the early admiral, uh, admiral courts uh, continue this tradition. They conducted their business close to the water's edge, often below the high tide watermark. So they actually built the court under the high tide watermark, the idea being, 
Let's wrap this shit up quickly, guys, right? Uh, we have to keep this in mind. Uh, and if high tide rolls in, roll up your pants. Uh, let's, let's get this over with, right? In fact, efficiency was uh, critical all along this, uh, uh, this entire process. In fact, um, during a period of war between Britain and Spain, an English privateer seized a vessel near the mouth of the Mississippi River, and they brought that ship to the Admiralty Court in London, which actually means they passed up a lot of English prize courts. They could have stopped at a number of vice admiralty, court, vice admiralty courts in the West Indies, in the American colonies, um, I don't know what year this was, possibly even Halifax, whatever it was, right? They had options a lot closer than to go to London. It was a valid take. They had the right to capture that ship. They could have kept all the stuff, but when they got to London, Lord Stowa, again, the guy who laid the foundation for, for all these legal precedents, said, uh, hey, this is crazy that you brought that ship all the way from the mouth of the Mississippi River to London. And he made them give the ship back and awarded damages for that and said, this is crazy. You have to respect the efficiency because when you take this pirate ship, you, it's not 100% yours. It's in this quasi-legal state where the, where the prize court had to sign off on it first. So you have to respect that. You have to bring it to the court and bring it to the court as fast as possible. So what if we can model this? What if we can have a cyber admiralty court? What if we can issue letters of mark and reprisal to trustworthy white hats? Not everybody. Don't, don't open up the board for everybody to hack back. But what if we can say, well, look, we actually uh, think you'd be pretty good at this. Uh, you're going to put up the bond you know, uh, so that we can hold financial responsibility if something goes wrong. And we can now staff an admiralty court uh, to, to adjudicate a takedown. Hey, you want to take down that botnet? Okay, well, I'll bring the evidence over here. We want to review it and make sure that this is a legitimate capture. So yeah, it's not a capture, right? So it's not a capture the same way we saw with privateers, right? Was you got you get to keep the ship, right? So the incentive is absolutely not going to be the same, and we have to address that. Uh, and I think like if you were going to get privateers interested, there'd have to be some incentive for that, right? Um, what we could dangle on the line, um, well, one immunity from prosecution because the computer computer fraud and abuse act is crazy vague. So maybe we make a um, uh, uh, contingent legality on you're going to participate in the prize court. Uh, but we could also, um, again, offer press, right? There are a number of organizations who, if they were to take down uh, a massive botnet or exploit kit, would love to take responsibility for that. And if you could have a prize court certify, yeah, we looked at their evidence, it's great, um, that would be fantastic for them. I know, I work for CrowdStrike. <laughs> We've been in the attribution game, we take a bunch of shit for it, right? People are always accusing us of not knowing what we're talking about and going on a limb. Uh, I was called out, uh, not me, but our, my colleagues were called out by, by Ann Coulter on Breitbart for what we were working on. It gets surreal when you get in the attribution game. People absolutely call you out. So if we had a neutral third party to certify these kind of things, there could be a lot of benefit in that. So instead of getting to keep the prize of taking possession, we're now offering a different sort of an incentive, right? But which isn't to say we couldn't also offer money. Cash is always nice. Uh, and if we are looking at a really nasty exploit kit out there that's a, a, you know, a, a burden on, on all of us, then I mean, we can pass the hat and actually put up some, some money as for whoever is able to, to take them down. But instead of it just being a bounty hunting program, we're now actually encouraging people to operate within a framework of transparency. Right? So uh, we, if we, do, we might be able to incentivize people towards transparency uh, and accountability. Now. What problems can we have with this? I want to try and anticipate uh, some of the objections here. Well, first, aren't I just kicking the can down the road with the prize court, right? What I haven't said is who deserves to get a letter of mark and reprisal. I haven't said what a good prize should be. I haven't said who is allowed to be a target. Who is it okay to go after? I haven't really specified these things. And to be honest, I, I don't know, really know the answer to those questions. My concern is nobody really knows the answer to those questions. This is an insanely complex process, and it's not one we're ever going to design from the top down. We're never going to come up with a perfect solution and then implement it. What I like about what I'm proposing here is that if I'm wrong, we can tweak it. If we issue a letter of mark to someone and they turn out to be irresponsible dicks, we can revoke that letter of mark. If, we're, if we have too many people going out there, we can lower 
uh, the, the prize they're getting. We can you know, reduce uh, the, the bounty or, or the, the prize or whatever it is. We can tweak the variables to try and get the level of, of hacking back of, of, to balance that sort of responsibility with the ability to go after and, and mobilize to help uh, attribute, to help get you know, the, the intel we need um, to help address some of the, the bad guys out there, right? So ultimately what I'm saying is not that I have all the answers, but we should try and look for a process that would allow for some discovery. What is the right level? What is the right number of people I can go out there and hack back? Because I don't have the answers to that. I'm just saying no one else does either. So if we have this kind of framework, we can now tweak around the edges and change these kind of variables um, to get the outcome we're looking for. Now, couldn't this be abused? Could the White House make a mistake? Uh, yeah, absolutely, right? But again, if we are holding responsibility, if you have to put up a bond, then hopefully we can address that. If we are adding a financial penalty to, um, to, uh, to hacking back and being wrong, well, then we're not going to have this crazy, uh, like, well, it's going to be the wild, wild west out there. We are addressing that. And uh, again, taking um, from one of the books I'm privateering on, I believe the book was, uh, it was called Prize and Prejudice, uh, which is a pun so good I hate I didn't come up with it, uh, which is a really self-absorbed emotion uh, to feel about this book. But uh, wonderful take on it, and actually wrote, and looking at the history of this thing, that the undisciplined behavior of many early privateers resulted in abuses that tainted the reputation of both privateers and prize making. But once prize courts were universally recognized as the only way to determine whether a prize was good and lawful or not, the practice of privateering regained its legitimacy. So by building that framework around it, they actually built legitimacy into that, that process. Um, again, sort of going back to one of the original objections, hacking back doesn't make sense for shareholder value. We should, like, you shouldn't be hacking back, you shouldn't be hacking back, I shouldn't be hacking back. That may well be true. But if we have this framework, then I'm not going to. I'm going to look at the ROI and say, yeah, I shouldn't be doing that. I might be wrong and I can't afford the penalty if I'm right. I'm not able to prove that I deserve a letter of mark and reprisal, so I'm not going to do that. So this works itself out. And that's another difference between law enforcement. Unlike the Royal, to quote from the um, same book, unlike the Royal Navy, privateers could not be obliged to attack enemy vessels. In fact, most of them took good care to avoid combat situations. This was not lack of courage on their part, but rather a realization that exposing themselves or their prizes to damage could result in time-consuming repairs ashore and reduce their profits. Uh, as Cronwell states, hard knocks, blood, and glory had small commercial value for an investor. While battle honors may uh, have held an appeal for naval commanders, privateersmen kept an eye on the ledger. So if we have a, a framework responsibility that has a cost to going along with this, that can, we can balance the supply and demand to where we actually want a legitimate level of hacking back. Okay, so let's say you still absolutely hate the idea of hacking back. It shouldn't be done. It causes nothing but problems. I still think you should support my proposal. And here's why. If you hate my proposal, well, adding, you still, if you hate hacking back, you, you still want to add transparency to this process. And then you can help determine the acceptable parameters for when this process is actually legal. Because one, it's happening. Hacking back is actually occurring out there. To quote Tom Kellerman, Chief Cybersecurity Officer for Trend Micro and former uh, member of President Obama's Commission on Cybersecurity states, active defense is happening. Confirming this belief, a survey at a recent Black Hat, it was uh, uh, 2012, uh, revealed that impressive 36% of respondents uh, admitted to engaging in retaliatory hacking. Um, Black Hat may not be a uh, representative sample, but still it goes to show that this is actually happening. So if you hate the idea of hacking back, then you also want to be able to add transparency and uh, accountability to this process, and this is one way to do it, right? So again, what I'm not coming out and saying is we need to legalize hacking back for everybody. And I don't necessarily know where the levels are, but we can now, this would actually also be then a framework for stopping hacking back, because you could increase then the, letter, the requirements to obtain a letter of mark and reprisal. You could increase the bond required, the, uh, the money you have to put up front in order to get it. You could increase the oversight. So if you hate hacking back, I think you should still be on board with this kind of proposal because now you can argue for higher standards for this levels of accountability. Right? So to kind of summarize this, what I'm really arguing is that the optimal level of hacking back is greater than zero. 
I don't know what it is. I don't know what it should be. But I want the debate to move forward. I actually find it incredibly frustrating that this debate has been pigeonholed between everybody hacks back or nobody hacks back. I don't know why the debate got caught up there. Uh, I find it puzzling that a, a, this, this community we have of mostly engineers are saying there are some problems associated with it, so let's not talk about it. I think there are problems we can solve. I think there are problems we can address. I don't know if this is exactly the right way to do it, but if we roll out this kind of framework, we now have a situation where we can adjust. We can tweak at the edges. We can adjust this as we go instead of waiting for someone else to write the laws. Because again, that's going to happen as well. In 2016, the Republican national platform was amended to include legalizing hacking back as one of the party's um, agenda items. As someone who believes hacking back should be legal for some people at least, part of me wants to think, okay, that could be good, but how are they going to do it? I have no idea, but if, it, if we get a bad law, it's going to take, I don't know how long to change. And if they pigeonhole us into a corner where it's the, it can't actually do any good, then well, the bad guys are going to come up with a whole new way of attacking us in the next six months. And if we want to go to the legislature, hey, we want to amend this law. Well, okay, you got a thousand dollars to come to this my fundraising dinner, we can sit down and talk about it. We'll address that. And if I like your concerns and I think people will vote for it, then we'll talk about it in the next legislative session. Uh, that's not going to keep up with cybersecurity. So I think if we can be in a situation where we're actually going to regulate ourselves instead of waiting for that, then we can get ahead of the problem. We can demonstrate that we can lay out when hacking back is acceptable. And maybe we'll disagree on where that is, but we can start to have that conversation instead of just throwing up our hands and saying, hey, there's some problems with hacking back, so let's not talk about it. Um, and if that's all interesting, uh, there's some of the, the references where I was getting into learning about how uh, the prize courts actually worked. Um, and with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those. I think I've a little bit of actual time left. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, um, you can ask them now, or of course, I'll be around uh, the, the rest of the day as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have some parameters around something like this, and that's vulnerability disclosure, right? So in the community, there is some sense of what good or acceptable practice is mm. for notifying a vendor, waiting some amount of time, which is, I guess, something you could argue about. Right. And, then, and we do constantly. But eventually, <laughs> but eventually you disclose it. Right. Okay. Would it be easier to start by the, I mean, we don't have a court for that, do we? Should we start by trying to have a court for whether this disclosure was allowed? It's a really interesting idea. And, and, and for everyone who didn't hear it, we are actually comparing it to um, the, the idea of uh, responsible disclosure. Right? So that, again, I, another contentious debate in the community. Okay, well, how long should we give people and, and, and so forth? And that doesn't have a court. Uh, and we've managed to find that. Um, and I think that's great. And if that's a model that we can emulate as well, then that may well work. Um, and I, I actually wouldn't want to say, hey, no, they need to have a court because they seem to be getting by. Uh, I think the one difference at this standpoint is we're stopping the debate on hacking back uh, because of these kind of potential problems. Um, disclosure is still happening. Now, we're obviously still arguing over what, uh, whether it should and what actually makes it responsible. That debate hasn't gone anywhere, uh, but it, it, it's still occurring. Right. I don't know how it came to be what it is. Right. I don't think it's there's any legal. I mean, it's in no law that I know of. Right. That it should be 30 days or 90 days or, or whatever. Yeah, and it's not set by legislation, right? And when I say court, I should also mean that I don't know if that should be a legal entity, if that should be a 5013C staffed with uh, with with part-time hackers. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it has to be an organized body or a set of ideas that we've loosely agreed on, which is probably what is it kind of happened with with disclosure. Well, there's money um, involved. Um, I think. Well, yeah, if there is actual you know. you right. Right. Which means that the people who are going to be governed by them need to have some input. Yeah, and the way I've, I've framed it, there's this kind of organizing body to do that. I don't know if it's 100% required. And again, 
I won't claim to know exactly what this will end up looking like or should look like. I don't know. But I'm hoping we can at least kickstart what it should look like. Right? Yeah, you have a question. Um, so, okay, so what do you gain from, from going after the, the bad guys? Um, well, uh, stopping a bad guy may be worth that in and of itself, right? If, if, especially if you're the one that's under direct attack. So that, that could be one. The other thing could be two is that um, if you look at a lot of like research firms and everything, there's some great publicity uh, in, in doing that, right? And if you look at a lot of different security companies, their blogs are, will happily take credit for when you know, they help stop this malware or take down this botnet. Um, my, my colleagues included, right? And the ship itself, yeah. Right. Right. And I don't, I, and, and there's, yeah, so you don't want to get that back if you have an attack. Right. So yeah, hacking back isn't going to make it whole. It's not going to make you right. whole, right? That's not going to be the incentive. Um, and, and and frankly, I, it's not like going after uh, pirates as a privateer was was uh, profitable for everybody out there. Um, frankly, I, I, I actually the look of it, um, probably sixty to seventy percent of the people who went out there and, and became pirate hunters uh, were not profitable, right? Um, but some were wildly profitable, right? So they were able to sort of incentivize that. Now, there are other ways we can incentivize that. So it's not to make you whole, necessarily. But maybe you do want to stop those guys. Or maybe they are such a pain in the ass that people are willing to put up a bounty for whoever does take them down. So there are different ways we could structure an incentive, if that's what it takes to, to go out there. But again, I don't know what that should be. That's one of the things we can tweak along the, along the way. Right? They did successfully crowdfund the audit and code audit of Okay, so yeah, a crowdfunded an audit of, of TrueCrypt. You know, so that was, people, people paid for it because it helped the community that they were part of. Right. Right, no, that's a really good example. And if we were all being just kicked around by the same adversary, uh, I, I could absolutely see that happening as well. Like, oh, hey, if you got spam in your spam filter from these addresses, want to kick five bucks into this thing? Then we'll put up the bounty, and then if someone takes them down, then they can they can take this, right? So we could actually structure that. We can kind of do that today, but uh, I think what we want is also the the responsibility to go with it, right? But if we are putting together a Kickstarter, if you're doing that, you have the opportunity to say, here are the parameters for when and if we'll pay out. It's not just, hey, I took them down. It's like, well, we'll prove it to me, right? Uh, and I think that would fall into the, the same kind of parameter. So it doesn't have to be a legal court. It could be a bunch of people putting together a Kickstarter. It'd be the same kind of framework. I don't know how legal that is, but it's one way that we could address it. You could do, uh, so one type of attack is against these, these SWIFT, uh, like banking terminal things. Right. right. So, I don't know, you know, maybe half a dozen banks got together. You could get that many people to agree that they have money. They do, and uh, I think they'd be pretty interested if they could actually, you know, uh, start to hunt some of these people down um, and, and shut them down, right? So I, I do think there'd be an incentive. I, I don't know if um, every piece of spam you get is going to res result in people being mobilized against them. That's obviously not the case, right? But there, I think there are certainly cases where people would be interested in passing the hat, so to speak, to, to, um, to get people interested in, in going after these people. Um, and maybe that means finding them and attributing it and going after them. Maybe it means shutting down their server. Maybe it means um, gathering enough intel that we can share uh, from a threat intel perspective to be able to stop these attacks. Like, look, great, because um, this maybe it's not shut down that server. Maybe it's reverse engineer the DGA and make that algorithm public. So we'll get it into everybody's feeds, right? It's not just go and kick down their door, right? Um, that's uh, ultimately legally problematic. Uh, to be certain, and then ultimately probably not a great use of everyone's time. When we talk about hacking back, there's a lot of ways to do that. It might just be blocking an IP address. Maybe we can open source a DGA so that everyone can now you know, respond to that. Um, and maybe it means a, a code audit. Right? That's a, another really good example.
Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for coming out. Thank you to B Sides and all the volunteers for doing this. I had a lot of fun putting this together. I was super nervous about talking about something uh, so controversial. So thank you guys for the for the great questions because uh, I've had a lot of fun talking about this over the past couple of days. Um, and look forward to uh, any other questions you have. I'll be around the rest of the day. Thank you.